A History of Central Banking and the Enslavement of Mankind by Stephen Mitford Goodson. Chapter 6 The Rise and Fall of State Banking, 1932 to 1945. You are aware that the gold standard has been the ruin of the states which adopted it, for it has not been able to satisfy the demands for money, the more so that we have removed gold from circulation as far as possible. Protocol number 20. I next argued that the gold standard, the fixing of rates of exchange and so forth, were shibboleths which I had never regarded and never would regard as weighty and immutable principles of economy. Money, to me, was simply a token of exchange for work done, and its value depended absolutely on the value of the work accomplished. Where money did not represent services rendered, I insisted it had no value at all. Adolf Hitler Reichsbank, the State Bank of National Socialist Germany out of the worldwide chaos and economic havoc of the 1930s, which had been induced by the Rothschild-controlled-slash-owned central banks, three phoenixes would arise. In May 1919, an insignificant soldier attended a lecture given by a former construction engineer turned economist, Dr. Gottfried Feder, 1883-1941, entitled The Abolition of Interest Servitude. The purpose of this course of lectures was to provide the soldiers with a background in politics and economics, which would enable them to monitor the many revolutionary and political movements active in Munich at that time. The following quotations taken from Mein Kampf reveal the decisive influence that Feder would have on Adolf Hitler's thinking. For the first time in my life, I heard a discussion which dealt with the principles of stock exchange capital and capital which was used for loan activities. After hearing the first lecture delivered by Feder, the idea immediately came into my head that I had found a way to one of the most essential prerequisites for the founding of a new party. To my mind, Feder's merit consisted in the ruthless and trenchant way in which he describes the double character of the capital engaged in stock exchange and loan transactions, laying bare the fact that this capital is ever and always dependent on the payment of interest. In the fundamental questions, his statements were so full of common sense that those who criticized him did not deny al fond that his ideas were sound, but they doubted whether it be possible to put these ideas into practice. To me, this seemed the strongest point in Fader's teaching, though others considered it a weak point. And again, I understood immediately that here was a truth of transcendental importance for the future of the German people. The absolute separation of stock exchange capital from the economic life of the nation would make it possible to oppose the process of internationalization in German business without at the same time attacking capital as such. For to do this would be to jeopardize the foundations of our national independence. I clearly saw what was developing in Germany, and I realized that the stiffest fight we would have to wage would not be against the enemy nations, but against international capital. In Fader's speech, I found an effective rallying cry for our coming struggle. A few weeks later, Hitler received an instruction from his military superiors to investigate a political association called the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, German Workers' Party. At this meeting, held on the 12th of September, 1919, in the Sternecker Brau Inn in Munich, about 20 to 25 persons were present. The main speaker was Gottfried Feder. Shortly thereafter, Hitler joined this party and received a provisional certificate of membership numbering seven. His first act on assuming control of the party was to rename it the National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, National Socialist German Workers' Party. Feder, who was the principal drafter of the party's 25 points, became the architect and theoretician of the program. In July 1933, he was appointed Under Secretary of State for Economic Affairs and in 1934, Reichskommissar, Reich Commissioner. Monetary reform was the very essence of National Socialism, as is revealed in the following extracts taken from the program of the NSDAP, the National Socialist German Workers' Party and its General Conceptions, published in Munich in 1932. Adolf Hitler prints its two main points in leaded type, the common interest before self, the spirit of the program. Abolition of the thraldom of interest, the core of National Socialism. Once these two points are achieved, it means a victory of their approaching universalist ordering of society in the true state over the present-day separation of state, nation, and economics under the corrupting influence of the individualist theory of society as now constructed. The sham state of today, oppressing the working classes and protecting the pirated gains of bankers and stock exchange speculators, is the area for reckless private enrichment and for the lowest political profiteering. It gives no thought to its people and provides no high moral bond of union. The power of money, most ruthless of all powers, holds absolute control and exercises corrupting, destroying influence on state, nation, society, morals, drama, literature, and on all matters of morality less easy to estimate. Break down the thraldom of interest is our war cry. What do we mean by the thraldom of interest? 
The landowner is under this thraldom, who has to raise loans to finance his farming operations, loans of such high interest as almost eat up the results of his labor, or who is forced to make debts and to drag the mortgages after him like so much lead. So is the worker, producing in shops and factories for a pittance, while the shareholder draws dividends and bonuses which he has not worked for. So is the earning middle class, whose work goes almost entirely to pay the interest on bank overdrafts. Thraldom of interest is the real expression for the antagonisms, capital versus labor, blood versus money, creative work versus exploitation. The necessity of breaking this thraldom is of such vast importance for our nation and our race that on it alone depends our nation's hope of rising up from its shame and slavery. In fact, the hope of recovering happiness, prosperity, and civilization throughout the world. It is the pivot on which everything turns. It is far more than mere necessity of financial policy. Whilst its principles and consequences bite deep into political and economic life, it is a leading question for economic study, and thus affects every single individual and demands a decision from each one. Service to the nation or unlimited private enrichment? It means a solution of the social question. Our financial principle. Finance shall exist for the benefit of the state. The financial magnates shall not form a state within the state. Hence our aim to break the thraldom of interest. Relief of the state, and hence of the nation, from its indebtedness to the great financial houses, which lend on interest. Nationalization of the Reichsbank and the issuing houses, which lend on interest. Provision of money for all great public objects, water power, railroads, etc., not by means of loans, but by granting non-interest-bearing state bonds and without using ready money. Introduction of a fixed standard of currency on a secured basis. Creation of a National Bank of Business Development currency reform for granting non-interest-bearing loans. Fundamental remodeling of the system of taxation on socio-economic principles. Relief of the consumer from the burden of indirect taxation and of the producer from crippling taxation, fiscal reform, and relief from taxation. Wanton printing of banknotes without creating new values means inflation. We all lived through it. But the correct conclusion is that an issue of non-interest-bearing bonds by the state cannot produce inflation if new values are at the same time created. The fact that today, great economic enterprises cannot be set on foot without recourse to loans is sheer lunacy. Here is where a reasonable use of the state's right to produce money which might produce most beneficial results. On the 30th of January, 1933, the National Socialists were swept to power by means of a coalition or... Regierung der Nationalen Konzentration, Government of National Concentration, with the Deutsche Nationale Volkspartei, German National People's Party. A somewhat attenuated version of monetary reform was introduced. In order to finance the state's work in rearmament programs, two dummy corporations called Gesellschaft für Öffentliche Arbeiten, OFA, and Metallforschung Gesellschaft, MEFO, were established. These corporations accepted bills of exchange from suppliers who fulfilled state orders. These bills of exchange were then discounted at the Reichsbank at a rate of 4%. They were issued for three months only, which was clearly unsatisfactory in view of the long-term nature of the various projects they were financing. They could, however, be extended at three monthly intervals for up to five years. In January 1939, matters came to a head when the president of the Reichsbank, Hjalmar Schacht, refused extension of three billion Reichsmarks worth of OFA and MEFO bills because of fears of inflation. On the 7th of January 1939, Schacht sent Hitler a memorandum signed by himself and the eight other board members of the Reichsbank, which contained the following main points. 1. The Reich must spend only that amount covered by taxes. 2. Full financial control must be returned to the Ministry of Finance then forced to pay for anything the army desired. 3. Price and wage control must be rendered effective. The existing mismanagement must be eliminated. 4. The use of money and investment markets must be at the sole discretion of the Reichsbank. This meant a practical elimination of Goering's four-year plan. Schacht concluded his memorandum with the ambiguous words, We shall be happy to do our best to collaborate with all future goals, but for now, the time has come to call a halt. By these means, Schacht intended to collapse the German economy, which during the period of 1933 to 1939 had increased its gross national product by 100%. From being a ruined and bankrupt nation in January 1933, with 7.5 million unemployed persons, Hitler had transformed Germany into a modern socialist paradise. He was justifiably angry and rejected the recommendations of the Reichsbank as mutiny. Two weeks later, Schacht was sacked. Roger Ellison described this momentous event as follows. On the 19th of January, 1939, Schacht was summarily dismissed and the Reichsbank was ordered to grant the Reich all credits requested by Hitler.
This decisive action essentially emasculated both the Reichsbank's control over domestic monetary policy and the German power base of international Jewry. It had the effect of removing from Jewish bankers the power to deflate and destroy the German economy. Excluding the implications of the interest rate paid on the MIFO bills, Germany could now be viewed as being on a Feder system rather than a Schacht system. The Reichsbank effectively became an arm of the government, with the only real change being in the fact that bills were now monetized or discounted under the auspices of the state rather than some Jewish lackey in the Reichsbank presidency. Thus, only in January 1939 did the Reichsbank become an authentic state bank. Schacht's dismissal also terminated the transfer of confidential information regarding all of Germany's economic developments, which he had been deviously giving without interruption to Montague Norman, a fellow Mason and governor of the Bank of England, 1920-1944. A new Reichsbank law, which was promulgated on the 15th of June, 1939, made the bank unconditionally subordinated to the sovereignty of the state. Article 3 of the law decreed that the bank, renamed the Deutsche Reichsbank, should be directed and managed according to the instructions and under the supervision of the Führer and Reichschancellor. Hitler was now his own banker, but having departed from the fold of international swindlers and usurers, he would, like Napoleon Bonaparte, who in 1800 had established the Banque de France as a state bank, suffer the same fate, an unnecessary war followed by the ruination of his people and country. It was this event which triggered World War II, the realization by the Rothschilds that universal replication of Germany's usury-free state banking system would permanently destroy their evil financial empire. In order to provide the Poles with a free hand, which would enable them to antagonize and provoke the Germans, a deceitful and worthless offer to guarantee Poland sovereignty was given by Great Britain on the 31st of March, 1939. During the next five months, the Polish government progressively intensified the oppression, harassment of, and attacks on the remaining one and a half million ethnic Germans living in Poland. These attacks, in which over 58,000 German civilians were killed by Poles in acts of wanton savagery, culminated in the Bromberg Massacre on the 3rd of September, 1939, in which five and a half thousand people were murdered. Initially, these provocations and atrocities were stoically ignored. Eventually, Hitler was compelled to employ military intervention in order to protect the Germans in Poland. On the 30th of August, 1939, in an act of great statesmanship, Hitler again offered to the Polish government the Marienwerder proposals. The four main proposals were as follows. 1. Retention of the existing 1919 borders as determined by the Treaty of Versailles. 2. The return of Danzig, population 370,000, to Germany, which was 97% German. 3. Construction of a 60-mile, 96-kilometer, autobahn and rail link connecting West and East Prussia, from Schönlanka to Marienwerder. 4. An exchange of German and Polish populations. On the orders of the international bankers, the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Edward Wood Halifax, strongly advised the Polish government not to negotiate. This is how and why World War II was started and disposes of the canard of German culpability. From 1939 onwards, although Germany made at least 28 known attempts at peace without conditions, they were all refused. The ensuing forced war resulted in victory for the international financiers and defeat and slavery for the people of Europe and indeed the world. In Europe, this enslavement was finally achieved with the establishment of the Rothschild-controlled European Central Bank on the 1st of June, 1998, and the introduction of the Euro on the 1st of January, 1999. Achievements of the German State Banking System one of the primary benefits which state banking and monetary reform conferred on the German people was the provision of adequate housing. During the period 1933 to 1937, 1,458,178 new houses were built to the highest standards of the time. Each house could not be more than two stories high and had to have a garden. The building of apartments was discouraged and rental payments on housing were not permitted to exceed 25 Reichsmarks per month or one-eighth of the income of an average worker. Employees earning higher incomes paid a maximum of 45 Reichsmarks per month. Interest-free loans of 1,000 Reichsmarks, about five months of gross pay, known as a Standardleihen, marriage loans, were paid in certificates to newlywed couples to finance the purchase of household goods. The loan was repayable at 1% per month, but for each child born, 25% of the loan was canceled. Thus, if a family had four children, the loan would have been considered repaid in full. The same principle was applied in respect of home loans, which were issued for a period of 10 years at a low rate of interest. The birth of each child also resulted in cancellation of 25% of the loan. 
education in schools, technical colleges, and universities was free, while the universal health care system provided everyone with free medical care. During the period 1933 to 1937, imports increased by 31% from 4.2 billion Reichsmarks to 5.5 billion Reichsmarks, while exports, particularly to Southeast Europe, rose by 20.4% from 4.9 billion Reichsmarks to 5.9 billion Reichsmarks. This increased trade is reflected in the 76.9% rise in inland shipping from 73.5 to 130 million tons conveyed and the 69.4% rise in ocean shipping from 36 million to 61 million tons transported. During this period, trade was greatly enhanced by barter, which bypassed the international payment system and the requirement of having to pay commission and interest on bills of exchange. By the late 1930s, 50% of all foreign trade was being conducted by means of barter transactions using offset accounting. There were 25 countries, mainly located in the Balkans and Latin America, participating in such barter agreements. In the same period, expenditure on roads and in particular the Reichsautobahn, of which 2,400 miles 3,862 kilometers, were completed by September 1939 rose by 229.5% from 440 million Reichsmarks to 1.45 billion Reichsmarks. This construction, which besides having symbolic value representative of the new Germany, was necessary in order to accommodate the substantial increase in licensed vehicles, which rose by 425% from 41,000 to 216,000 vehicles, and the even higher increase of 622% in licensed commercial vehicles from 7,000 to 50,600. Between 1932 and 1938, iron ore production increased by 45.4% from 843,000 to 1,226,000 tons. German ores contained only 25% iron as opposed to the superior iron content of the Swedish ores, which they could not afford. This difficulty was overcome with the Krupp-Bren process, which produced high-quality steel. Between 1932 and June 1939, the index of coal production rose by 85.5% from 69 to 128, while the energy index rose during the same period by 76% from 75 to 132. As a result of all this heightened and ever-increasing economic activity, unemployment, which stood at 30.1% in 1933, had been reduced to almost zero by July 1939, and retired workers had to be enticed back to the labor market in order to make up for the shortage of skilled workers. In contrast, the unemployment rate in the United States, which had stood at 25.1% in 1933, had according to the National Industrial Conference Board, declined only marginally to 19.8% by January 1940, a situation which may be attributed to the irrational but nonetheless deliberate policies of the Rothschild-controlled Federal Reserve Bank and the parasitic private banking sector. National income in Germany rose by 43.8% from 45.2 billion Reichsmarks to 65 billion Reichsmarks between 1932 to 1937, while between 1932 and June 1939, the index of producer goods increased by 219.6% from 46 to 147. Yet, the cost of living advanced by only 4% or less than 1% per annum, a rate which would be achieved throughout the 12 years of state banking under National Socialism. The German monetary policy was non-inflationary because government expenditures, which increased the level of consumer demand, could in turn elicit a correspondingly increased quantity of disposable consumer goods. By 1939, Germany had become the most powerful country in the history of Europe. Its gross domestic product at an annual average growth rate of 11% per annum had doubled in the short space of six years of quasi-state banking. The Germans were now the happiest and most prosperous people in the world, fully employed and enjoying one of the highest standards of living. This success was achieved by the hard work of the German people and with the support of an honest money system not based on usury or the gold standard. One of the myths propagated by establishment historians is that Germany's economic renaissance was based on armaments production. The following table reveals modest levels of defense expenditure, which only picked up in 1938 to 1939 when Germany started to feel threatened by her neighbors. Even expenditure of 22% of national income on defense just before World War II started may be deemed as not being too excessive, when one bears in mind that Germany's borders possess few natural boundaries, and at that time, she was surrounded by hostile neighbors, Czechoslovakia, France, and Poland. Germany also had to replenish the armaments, which she had been forbidden to possess in terms of the Treaty of Versailles. The English historian A.J.P. Taylor writes that, the state of German armament in 1939 gives the decisive proof that Hitler was not contemplating general war, and probably not intending war at all. Post-World War II Developments In May 1945, 
the Deutsche Reichsbank ceased operations, although its affairs were only wrapped up in 1961, and it was succeeded in the western half of the country by the Bank Deutscher Länder, Bank of German States, on the 1st of March, 1948. This bank introduced the Deutsche Mark on the 21st of June, 1948, and later became known as the Deutsche Bundesbank, which was established on the 26th of July, 1957. Although legally independent and modeled on the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank, the Bundestag, or Federal Parliament, exerted considerable control and influence over its policies, and it was not as fully independent during that time as most central banks are today. During 2001, as a result of its membership of the European Central Bank, the Deutsche Bundesbank ceded most of its authority to that organization. Its remaining responsibilities, which are shared with the ECB, are the issuing of banknotes, managing the clearinghouse, bank supervision, and management of currency reserves. The principal objective of the ECB, as laid down in Article 127.1 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, is to maintain price stability. This obsession is largely responsible for the record levels of unemployment and low levels of growth in GDP currently being experienced and the ongoing collapse in the birth rate. The ECB was established on the 1st of January, 1998, and formally became operational on the 1st of January, 1999, with the introduction of the euro. This Rothschild-controlled bank is ironically situated at Kaiserstrasse 29, Frankfurt am Main, not too far from the Judengasse, Jews Lane, where Mayor Amschel Rothschild and his brother, Kalman, set up a shop peddling coins and medals in the 1780s. For those 18 countries which have foolishly adopted the euro and joined the ECB, their subjugation and enslavement are a fait accompli. Fascist Italy on the 28th of October, 1922, Benito Mussolini and his National Fascist Party came to power. Fascism should be more appropriately described as corporatism, as it symbolized a merger of state and corporate power. In 1936, the Chamber of Deputies was replaced by a National Council of Corporations with 823 representatives from industry, labor, and the states who guided industry and settled labor disputes. In the 1920s, by means of deficit spending, a program of public works was instituted, which was unrivaled in modern Europe at that time. Bridges, canals, autostrada of 2,485 miles, 4,000 kilometers, hospitals, schools, railway stations, and orphanages were built. Forests were planted and universities were endowed. The Pontine marshes were drained and 310 square miles, 802 square kilometers, were reclaimed. As part of the program of national self-sufficiency, or autarky, agriculture was subsidized and regulated. The State Bank of Italy in 1926, Mussolini first intervened in the banking sector by granting the Banca d'Italia jurisdiction over the issue of banknotes and the management of minimum requirements for bank reserves, including gold. This formed part of his policy of using Italian fascism primarily to create an autarkic state not subject to the vagaries of world trade and finance. In 1927, Italy received a loan from J.P. Morgan of $100 million to meet a special emergency. Thereafter, Mussolini refused to negotiate or accept any more foreign loans, as he was determined to keep Italy free from financial subservience to foreign banking interests. In 1931, the state arrogated to itself the right to supervise all major banks by means of the Instituto Mobiliare Italiano, Institute of Italian Securities. In 1936, the process was completed when, by means of the Atto Reforma Bancaria, Banking Reform Act, the Banca d'Italia and the major banks became state institutions. The Banca d'Italia was now a fully-fledged state bank, which had the sole right to create credit out of nothing and advance it for a nominal fee to other banks. Limits on state banking were lifted, as was the case with the Bank of Japan, see Infra, and Italy abandoned the gold standard. The State Bank of Japan The Bank of Japan, or Nippon Ginko, was founded on the 10th of October, 1882. Although the Japanese imperial household was the largest shareholder, it functioned as a typical central bank, i.e., for the benefit of private banks to the detriment of public interest. In 1929, C.H. Douglas, whose system of social credit had been previously discussed, went on a lecture tour of Japan. His proposals for allowing government to create the nation's money and credit free of interest were enthusiastically received by the leaders of both the Japanese government and industry. All of Douglas's books and pamphlets were translated into Japanese, and more copies were sold in that country than in the rest of the world. The reorganization of the Bank of Japan into a state bank administered exclusively for the accomplishment of national interests was commenced in 1932. The reform of the bank was completed in 1942 when the Bank of Japan law was remodeled on Germany's Reichsbank Act of January 1939. The bank operated in the following manner. It declared that the bank was a special corporation of a strongly national nature. The bank was to assume the task of controlling currency and finance and supporting and promoting the credit system in conformity with policies of the state to ensure the full use of the nation's potential. 
Further, it was to be managed with the accomplishment of national aims as its sole guiding principle, Article 2. As for the functions of the bank, the law abolished the old principle of priority for commercial finance, empowering it to supervise facilities for industrial finance. The law also authorized the bank to make unlimited advances to the government without security and to subscribe for and to absorb government bonds. In respect of note issues, the law made permanent the system of the maximum issues limit. Thus, the bank could make unlimited issues to meet the requirements of munitions industries and of the government. On the other hand, government supervision of the bank was markedly strengthened. The government could nominate, superintend, and give orders to the president and the directors. There was also a clause giving the government more comprehensive powers to give so-called functional orders to the bank to direct it to perform any function it deems necessary for the attainment of the bank's purpose. Moreover, the law made a wide range of the bank's business subject to government approval, including such matters as the alteration of bank rate, note issues, and accounts. Japan had been experiencing the same traumatic difficulties caused by the artificially created Great Depression. However, the conversion from a central to a state banking methodology produced results which were both swift and sustained. The above table illustrates the progressive improvement which took place in the Japanese economy once the shackles of usury had been removed. During the 1931 to 1941 period, manufacturing output and industrial production increased by 140% and 136% respectively, while national income and the gross national product were up by 241% and 259% respectively. These remarkable increases exceeded by a wide margin the economic growth of the rest of the industrialized world. In the labor market, unemployment declined from 5.5% in 1930 to 3% in 1938. Industrial disputes decreased with the number of stoppages down from 998 in 1931 to 159 in 1941. By the late 1930s, Japan had become the leading economic power in East Asia, and her exports were steadily replacing those of America and England. In August 1940, Japan announced the formation of the Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere. The fear that these countries would adopt Japan's state banking methods posed such a serious threat to the Rothschild-owned and controlled U.S. Federal Reserve Bank that a war was deemed to be the only means of countering it. How Japan was forced into World War II From July 1939, relations with America rapidly deteriorated after the USA unilaterally abrogated the Treaty of Commerce of 1911 and thereby restricted Japan's ability to import essential raw materials. These measures were imposed avowedly because of the war in China and were followed in June 1940 by an aviation fuel embargo and a ban on the export of iron and steel to Japan in November 1940. On the 25th of July 1941, all Japanese assets in England, Holland, and America were frozen after Japan, with the permission of Vichy France, had peacefully occupied Indochina in order to block off China's southern supply routes and all trade between Japan and America was summarily terminated. At the same time, President Franklin D. Roosevelt closed the Panama Canal to all Japanese shipping and a rubber and oil embargo was enforced, which resulted in the latter case of the loss of 88% of all supplies. Without oil, Japan could not survive. General Hideki Tojo, Prime Minister, October 1941 to July 1944, explains in his diary how the United States continually thwarted Japanese efforts at maintaining peace. Japan's peaceful commercial relations were being persistently undermined by the USA and posed a grave threat to her future existence. By means of the economic blockade, a noose was being placed around Japan's neck. Not only were the United States, England, China, and Holland encircling Japan through economic pressures, but naval forces throughout the region in the Philippines, Singapore, and Malaya were being redeployed and strengthened. American battleships were observed steaming through the seas surrounding Japan. An American admiral claimed that the Japanese fleet could be sunk in a couple of weeks, while British Prime Minister Churchill declared that England would join America's side within 24 hours. General Tojo wrote, Japan attempted to circumvent these dangerous circumstances by diplomatic negotiation, and although Japan heaped concession upon concession in the hope of finding a solution through mutual compromise, there was no progress because the United States would not retreat from its original position. Finally, in the end, the United States repeated demands that, under the circumstances, Japan could not accept, complete withdrawal of troops from China, repudiation of the Nanking government, withdrawal from the Tripartite Act. Numerous diplomatic initiatives were made by Japan, including the offer of a summit on the 8th of August 1941, but they all failed. By the 2nd of December 1941, Japan had been cut off from 75% of her normal trade by the Allied blockade and thus found herself forced into attacking America in order to maintain her prosperity and to secure her existence as a sovereign nation.
The uncompromising and unrelenting pressure applied by the usurers in New York had deliberately provoked Japan into taking retaliatory action. Post-World War II Developments Following Japan's defeat, one of the first acts of the United States occupation forces in Japan in September 1945 was to restructure the Japanese banking system so as to make it compliant with the norms of the international bankers, i.e. usury. The unrestricted financing of the state by the Bank of Japan was abolished and the large industrial combines, the Zaibatsu, were dismantled. This policy was carried out by Joseph Dodge, a Detroit banker, who was financial advisor to the Supreme Allied Commander, General Douglas MacArthur. The Ministry of Finance was, however, able to retain a measure of control over the banking system and, in particular, monetary policy. In 1988, Japan was adversely affected by its compliance with the Basel I regulations, which obliged the Bank of Japan to raise the minimum capital requirements of its risk-related assets from 2% to 8%. This action precipitated an on-off recession which has lasted for the past 29 years. In April 1998, the Ministry of Finance was forced by law to yield to the independent Bank of Japan. Since that time, the Bank of Japan has functioned as a typical Rothschild-controlled central bank, which seldom performs its duties in the best interests of the Japanese people.